Hey guys, Spencer here. Today, we're going to be going over a really, really neat unsupervised learning method, and that's going to be k-means clustering. Well, what is unsupervised learning, you might ask? It is essentially unlabeled data. So you would have typically a large data set with no dependent variables, and you are essentially trying to determine what type of groups that exist within the data set so that you can potentially perform a classifier algorithm, or you can have more of a direct insight as to what type of variables or what type of relationships there are between the variables. Now, typically, unsupervised learning can be used in almost any type of industry. However, it is predominantly used, or at least to my knowledge, it is predominantly used for the genomics area or biology. When we have a genome sequence and all that, we have a ton of data and everything is like sort of unlabeled. Other types of quote unquote industries or sectors that unsupervised, unsupervised learning is commonly used is genome sequencing, genetic clustering, medical imaging, image segmentation, and potentially even in computer recognition or computer vision for image recognition. I put together a deck that sort of details how k-means clustering is typically used and the back end on how each of these components are configured and what like at a very high level how the theory is applied to the k-means clustering. So what exactly is k-means clustering? You can think about it as trying to essentially group together features into one cluster or one group, so to say. It's one of the most popular unsupervised learning models that are out there because it's very easy to understand and it's actually quite it's quite good uh, in terms of like in terms of industry practices. Uh, there are other different types of unsupervised learning methods. Um, however, this type of method is very un understandable and it's read readily applied to whatever type of problem that might exist out there. So K means clustering. Uh, essentially in the back end is that it would have a set number or a fixed number of clusters that's being inputted and based on the number of number of clusters where k is equal to the number of clusters you would go on these um, you go to these clusters to calculate the centroid you can think about the centroid as a center of mass within an n-dimensional object so it's just the middle point within this huge hyperspace so to say. And so you are doing this for k uh, clusters, and then you would essentially calculate the distance between these centroids. The k-means clustering would then merge together similarities between the two different clusters. And whichever clusters are the same, then or lo like minimal in distance, then they will be merged together. If they're not as similar as some other cluster, then they won't be merged and then it will keep on iterating through however many iterations that you might have and so on and so forth but the overall distance measuring uh, k-means always uses a euclidean distance there are other different types of unsupervised learning methods that uses a different form of a metric to compare different clusters together and to determine whether or not they need to merge or not merge so as i was saying earlier uh, the k-means algorithm essentially picks a random point uh, to calculate the centroid and based on that point it would look for the best um, it will look for the best position within each of these different observations that it's given and calculate the centroids from there so you're giving k points and within each of these k points inside of your data space you would then uh, go and try to calculate where these points best fit within the overall data and the algorithm will keep on going until either your centroid values do not change or the number of iterations have been reached. So this is an iterative method. Now before we even begin, there is one package that I would recommend that you would install if you're going to be walking uh, with me on this walkthrough. Uh, it's going to be the Facto Extra. For this particular package, I'm going to be utilizing this for visualizing the clusters that we are going to have. Uh, the data that we'll be using is the built-in IRIS data set. It's really, really simple. It's in only 150 observations. And this is typically used for supervised learning techniques. However, we will just 
go out, go and take out the species uh, column and compare the clustering method k-means um, with our given data, the sepal length, sepal width, petal length, petal width, and see if it uh, essentially successfully, successfully clusters um, the corresponding data with its corresponding species. Cool. So first thing we want to do is to just like save the data types or the the features that we're going to be using over here. I'm just going to be doing this. Uh, get the iris labels, labels, and just do iris and species. Load that in. Let's take a look at the distribution that we are having, that we have for the iris labels. Um, notice that it's a balanced data set. So just the observations in each of these factors that we have over here. Uh, so that's a pretty even distribution that we have going on there. Uh, the iris data is going to be all the other observations or the features. So it's gonna be the first column to the fourth column. So I'll just be iris and then to the four over here. The iris data, so that should not have, yep. So this is gonna be our data. It's gonna be unlabeled. Uh, and we will compare our unlabeled and see how well that does with the labels that we have up here. So the very first step that we want to do in order to, well, well, right before we actually do the k-means is that we want to scale our data. Scaling your data is incredibly important because the distance metrics will, rel well, we will want the distance metrics to be relatively unweighted. And when we are scaling our data down, we would have like a more of a balanced data set, since, especially since we're going to be using the Euclidean distance, and that's a default distance uh, to use. So let's do the iris data. Let's call this like scale. And we'll just be scaling the iris data set, iris data, and load that in. So we have all of our values that are scaled, 150 observations. And it gives you the, the type of scale and the centers for that particular value. The second step after we scale in our data, now we want to calculate the distance metrics between our observations. Now, our given distance uh, equation or function is actually built in for the facto extra. So I'm just going to be doing iris data and I will be calling a dist function on the iris data scale. Call that over here. Now, this, this distance function over for the built-in package facto extra, that is essentially uh, the distance metric. It, the distance metric used is the Euclidean distance, and uh, it will look something like that. Now, the Euclidean distance on this particular data set looks something like this. Cool. Now, the third step. Third step is to calculate how many how many clusters you need because when we are using the k-means clustering algorithm, we need to have a set or a fixed input on however many clusters that we are using uh, because the method requires that a set number of clusters are used in order to, order to calculate its uh, centroids and center of masses and to determine what needs to be merged and what does not need to be merged. One way to do this is to use somewhat of an elbow plot. Uh, it's very similar to the scree plot on which I've done earlier in the PCA uh, in the PCA type video and I'll make sure that there's a little pop-up that pops here if you want to check that out. Um, but let's take a look at that real quick. So I went ahead and typed out the type of function that you'll be using. Uh, it's the uh, function within the facto extra. We're just passing in our scale data up here and you just specify the type of method and the type of method that we'll be using is the uh, within sum squares. So that's within sum squares and that is the type of metric that it will be using in order to identify what needs to be merged and what does not need to be merged. So let's do a really quick summary on what that function looks like. It determines an optimal number of clusters. And so based on this graph, which I apply right here, uh, we can now utilize our knowledge of the elbow looking plots and determine which is a good point to identify. So we already know that there are three types of uh, clusters or features or groups 
uh, that we want to cluster this to. So we will be using three in order to identify uh, or in order to merge in our clusters together. When we are looking at this elbow plot, we are essentially trying to determine the however many number of clusters that we need to use, the optimal number. And when we are looking at the degree at which each of these clusters are providing within the sum of squares, uh, we want to look at diminishing returns, so to say. So with whenever our slopes are when you're getting closer and closer to zero, uh, we can determine which type of, well, the number of clusters to use when we are trying to determine uh, the, the slope magnitude. So we could definitely have a choice for three. We can use four, we can use five, but no more, no more than five because it just becomes like sort of like upward curve and then downward. So in this case, we'll be using three. Uh, and as you might tell already, this is very subjective almost. Uh, we are essentially applying our intuition and to see which works and which does not work. Now that we know uh, the number of clusters that we will be utilizing, we will now do the k-means, k-means clustering. So let's do km.out, the output of the k-means is going to be the k-means function where we'll be passing in our data and our scaled uh, values. And we'll be passing in the number of centers, which is equal to three. The centers is just like the k uh, for k-means. And we will be starting for, um, you can do like 100. Now let's print this out, what that looks like, km.out. And this provides us the type of group that each of our observations are a part of. And we can easily assign this to a, like an additional feature within our data set and determine whether or not we should use a classifying algorithm there. Uh, but it does provide what type of group each of these observations belongs. It provides you a sum of squares between sum of squares and the total sum of squares. We have 76.7%, uh, which is, eh, it's all right. 76% um, classification or identification of an observation with a group. So uh, that's all right. It can always be better though. Cool. Now let's try and visualize this. Visualize the clustering algorithm results. So let us get the km.out, let's get the clusters over here, and let's label this as km.clusters. Now, once we have our cluster, we are going to call the row name so that we could closely identify which observation lies in the graph. So one way of doing this is that we are just going to be copying our iris data scale over here, and we're just going to be labeling the row names. And we'll just be doing that via iris on species. So our data looks something like this now, where we have instead of one through 150, uh, we have the type of uh, species that it is. And also, in fact, we actually need to include a number in here as well. So the dimension iris species, I'm just do iris, call the number of rows and we're going to separate that with uh, underscore. And this should be sequential. Yes, that looks good. OK, let's do that instead. So let's take another look at this. Yeah, because we want we want each of these row names to be uh, unique. We don't want any identical row names. So that's why we did the append of the sequential numbers. So once we have our data over here and everything is sort of like combined all into one data set, now it's time to start visualizing this. So we just use the fviz cluster and we want to list this in here. List data is equal to your iris data scale and we will be inputting the cluster as the km.clusters over here. So this is what our plot looks like over here. And we can look at which groups have been identified uh, and which type of observations have been correctly identified. So it looks like for cluster one right here, it looks like everything in here is like Satosa or for the most part it's Satosa. Uh, over here it looks like it's Versicolor and over here it looks like it's Virginica. 
and we can have a more concrete understanding on what this looks like. All we do is do the table function. We do our KM clusters and we do our iris species. Do something like that. So it looks like we did all of our cytosis into one, so that's good. And then of course we have some errors, uh, misclassifications on what some of our observations are looking like. But going back to the graph over here, um, as you can tell, let's let that load. Yeah, as you can tell, this is how well our clusters have been done. Um, you can see which type of uh, observations have been incorrectly identified. It looks like that's a 73 over there versus a color versus the Virginica, which is 135 over here. So there's obviously some mismatching here. Uh, there are different types of algorithms to utilize. But in a nutshell, this is k-means. Hey guys, I hope that you enjoyed this video on k-means. The next steps in order to, I don't know, go a step further uh, is to put the cluster identifiers as part of the original data set. And then you can apply various uh, supervised learning classifiers and determine whether or not these specific observations live in these current uh, factors that we have, like the, Satota, like the Satosas, the Virginicas, and the third one, which I'm not getting off the top of my head. Um, but I hope that you like this video. Please make sure to like and subscribe. It really helps me out and helps my self-esteem. Uh, <laughs> I'll see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.